This is Inside the Right. So, Tim, we have some major news out of Florida. Uh, codifying abortion rights and marijuana legalization will both be on the ballot in November as the result of a Florida state Supreme Court decision. How in play do you think that this makes Florida? Well, uh, look, I, I think that it's, that's up in the air. Uh, you know, I think that uh, just to, as a baseline, let's look at the fact, let's look at Georgia, right? Neighboring state, there's some demographic differences, more black voters in Georgia, uh, I think more college educated white voters in Georgia, so a little bit more friendly demographically to Democrats, but Trump wins Georgia by five in 2016, Biden wins it by 0. 0.5 in 2020, so five and a half point swing. Florida was only a four point win for Biden, or for, excuse me, for Trump in 2020. And so uh, it's certainly not crazy to think that this could be a state that's in play. And I think that the big question for the for Democrats is, you know, how can they um, use the abortion issue and, and other issues to try to galvanize people towards Biden and try to uh, push them away from Trump? Because I think that Trump is going to be relying on a lot of voters that maybe are pro-choice, but still vote for him anyway. I, I, you got to remember that Trump brought into the party, you know, he has his evangelical base, of course, but Trump brought into the Republican Party a lot of non-college educated, secular, working class guy, men mostly, who aren't particularly religious, aren't particular aren't certainly don't want very strict abortion laws and so you know the question is can you peel some of those folks off of trump and that's going to be the big challenge for democrats if they want to flip florida well you'd spoken about you know comparing one state to to florida for example and you you pointed out georgia how does what happened in ohio because they had virtually an identical referendum with abortion protections and also marijuana legalization on their ballot and obviously both of those went through and that is i think even more hostile territory for democrats so how would that inform your thoughts on florida then yeah both those went through but uh, republicans have done pretty well in ohio lately right on the, on the ballot right so and and this happened in florida too where minimum wage increase passed in florida on the same ballot that ron DeSantis won right so this is the challenge for Democrats. It's is is you can look at this and say, hey, this is good news, right? It's gonna help with turnout. It's gonna help with turnout with younger folks um that are gonna be more disproportionately Democrat. Um, you know, I think it's not a big secret to say that younger votes, I think, are more voters are more passionate about abortion rights and marijuana laws than they are about Joe Biden, right? So you're gonna bring out hopefully some more folks. That's good. Then the question is how do you prevent these crossover voters or how do you how do you tamp it down, right? Like the types of people that are socially liberal but are voting for Republicans for other reasons, you know, be it other types of culture war stuff, be it inflation concerns. How do you message to them? And and to me, um, you know, something I've been suggesting to Democratic strategists I talk to is is in a lot of ways, Mike Johnson, and we've talked about this on the show, it's a bigger boogeyman than Trump, right? Like, even though Trump overturned the Supreme Court, I understand the facts. A lot of like low info voters look at him and say, oh, he's not that religious. He's not that crazy on social issues. Mike Johnson is crazy on social issues. Like he wants a zero week abortion ban. And if Trump wins and Republicans get the House, then then Mike Johnson is going to have control over what the federal abortion laws are no matter what voters in Florida say. So so Democrats have to get that message through to those voters so that they know that like voting for an abortion, uh, uh, voting for a bill that would codify, essentially codify something similar to Roe in Florida does not guarantee its protection. Like there the other, you got to vote for, for politicians that will uphold that ballot initiative as well. Well, you alluded to this a little bit, but do you think that these ballot initiatives in Florida for abortion and marijuana legalization could actually backfire and give these Republican voters who otherwise, you know, might have made an exception and voted for Democrats on these issues. It gives them an out because then they can say, well, now I can just vote for the ballot initiatives that I want and still get the Republicans who I, who I would have voted for at the end of the day. Yeah, I, I think that it could and it could give them that out. And that is why it is incumbent on on Democrats and on Biden and on allies of Biden to uh, uh, educate and to spend the next six months, seven months, eight months, educating these voters about why that vote does it does not actually give them protections, right? Like the, the, it is unclear what would happen if the Republicans ended up with a trifecta where they had their White House, House and Senate, they could pass a federal abortion law. And and I right. think that, look, we have an article today in the Bulwark, uh, Mark Caputo, who's our kind of MAGA reporter, um, uh, you know, he has uh, he talks to people in Trump world 
And they say, say to them they won't they don't know what to do about this issue, right? Like Trump doesn't want to talk about it. He calls it the A word um, when it comes up privately, apparently, because he knows that it's a big threat to him. And so uh, the, Trump has to be backed into a corner where he has to kind of choose. Like right now, he's getting to kind of do this thing where the evangelicals are with him because he did the Supreme Court, and some of these secular voters are with him because they don't think they think that he'll really do anything on abortion. Like that's got to stop, right? Like Trump has to be pr pressured and backed into a corner and forced to choose. And I think that if he's forced to put out a position where him and Mike Johnson are kind of aligned or and Ron DeSantis, who put in place that six week ban, that then is going to hopefully give Democrats an opportunity to talk to some of those voters um, who who want to have their cake and eat it, too. And so, and and say, no, like this isn't you know, this isn't the protection that you think it is just voting for this ballot initiative. Uh, Tim mentioned The Bulwark. That's the YouTube channel that he's on throughout the week. So for those watching right now, if you want to see and hear more from Tim, please subscribe to The Bulwark. I'll put the link right here on this screen and also in the post description of this video. And this way you can help support this pro-democracy ecosystem that we're building right now. Tim, at a bare minimum, it will force Republicans, this ballot initiative in Florida, to at least spend money there. It puts it in play to the extent that at least there is the hope that, that we might see um, Democrats uh, contest Florida. So how impactful will that be? Will the prospect of at least forcing them to spend money be? Yeah, it's a pretty small map right now. So I, I think that there have been a, you know, the Florida, I, again, it's hard to say how much will the Democrats want to put in there. And this is certainly Biden has a big money advantage right now. That's certain. So I, I think that that gives them some strategic options about what they want to do. I'd also look at North Carolina. Right. Um, and we talked about this Mark Robinson, who is the far, far right uh, Republican that won the governor's nomination in that state, uh, who's advanced insane conspiracies. I mean, he's like the Gary Lake, Herschel Walker mashup of the cycle. I, he, like if you think of a conspiracy theory or a far right position, he he's he's taken it. And so I, I think that in a lot of ways that, you know, if you look at the Florida abortion and, and marijuana initiatives and then if you look at the Mark Robinson nomination in in North Carolina, you know, that gives Democrats maybe a couple more states that they can look at and decide where they want to spend their resources. Uh, to me, it probably seems like North Carolina ends up being a more likely place. Uh, but uh, that expanding of the map um, is, uh, uh, you know, is something that the Democrats have the luxury of doing because Biden has raised more money, you know, and because uh, uh, these state based Republicans have have nominated people and advanced extreme laws that have made themselves more vulnerable than they might have otherwise been. We've spoken about this issue, the issue of money in previous episodes, but just for posterity here, how much of an impact does money have? Because for most of us who don't work in campaigns, it just seems like this nebulous, this nebulous issue where, you know, like we don't really know what it's going to. It's like, a, it's like a, you know, an easy uh, like number to point to, to say like, oh, he's raised more money. But at the end of the day, how much of an impact does that actually have? Yeah. Especially, especially in, in a p political environment where, you know, polarization is so calcified and where it doesn't feel like people move that much anyway? I think that it's a good question. I think a, having a narrow money advantage, um, you know, there is, um, you know, I think that uh, there's kind of an economic term about where, you know, the, the last dollar that you spend doesn't go as far as the first dollar that you spent, right? Like, yeah. you know, eventually you start spending so much money, there's like this law of diminishing returns that kicks in. Right. And and I think that, you know, if you're if you're in a presidential race where it's like Joe Biden raised 300 million and Trump raised 296 million, it's kind of like, well, who really cares about that last yeah. 4 million? But right now we're in a position where Biden has raised so much more than Trump that there are some strategic advantages, right? Like he can go up on air in a state where Trump can't afford it. Maybe he can add a state to the map that the Republicans decide that they're not going to compete in. I, you know, I, I do think North Carolina is a good potential example of that. You know, Trump's event calendar uh, is seeming kind of light these days. I think that he's trying to hoard money and, and that's how the Trump organizes. So I do think that there are some tangible impacts here just because of the degree of the financial advantage that Biden has. And that's that's different than in, in you know, 2020, 2016. And do you think that going up on air, like, for example, with these TV ads, is as impactful as it used to be? Like, what do you think if you were running either one yeah. of these campaigns, where would you where would you allocate resources that you think it would be most effective? Yeah, I mean, obviously, TV ads are not as impactful as they were the, back in the day where everybody watched the nightly news and you knew how to get everybody yeah. in one place, right? And there were three channels. Uh, so there's they're obviously less impactful. They're obviously less impactful. We have two candidates that are so well known. I mean, it's unprecedented. We have two former presidents. 
But I think there are two things that the Biden team can do with paid. Um, one is is communicate to the people within the Democratic coalition that are frustrated with him, right? And and talk to them and remind them about things that they like about him, right? If you think, if you look at the polls right now, a big part of the reason why Trump's winning is because Trump um, is getting all of his voters from last time mostly. Like, there's a small number of of Republicans who have uh, who are who have uh, peeled off, but he's getting a greater percentage than Biden is. A lot of the Biden people aren't saying they're for Trump. They're just like, I don't know. I'm mad about Gaza. I'm mad about inflation. Whatever it is, Biden can communicate to those groups, black voters, young voters, and say, Okay, remember I did this. Remember I did that. That's a useful. You're not really trying to persuade with that money. It's just like a reminder, an education. Like we did these things that you like. Remember, you know. So I think that's useful. And then I, I do think that there that Nikki Haley vote, which we've talked about, there's there is going to be some uh, ways in which Biden can kind of message to them, I'm not in league to the far left. Like you don't have to worry about me, right? Like like we are aligned yeah. on Ukraine, for example. We have a couple of common um, views, and so I, I, I think that the, speaking to those voters who are all sort of Biden curious already, I think that's a useful re- way to. Um, to spend that money. And, uh, and that's different than like trying to persuade Trump voters or trying to persuade people that are going to be really hard to persuade, I think, based on paid ads, um, given the nature of this race. So let's finish off with this. The flip side of that is what Trump is doing in his campaign. And that is like this frothing, breathless, just fear porn, full negative ads, uh, fear mongering about, you know, the dystopian future that awaits us. Uh, How effective do you think that that strategy is going to be just going all in on on negative politics on, uh, you know, the, the usual like from everything from migrant caravans to trans kids are coming to turn your kids trans and just the whole litany of of, frogs. uh, Don't forget the frogs. Frogs frogs are going trans too. Um, yeah. So I, I think I have some concerns about it. I, if you look back at those two groups I just talked about, this is the battleground, right? Like Trump is trying to go into the Biden coalition and he's going to do rap fucking with young voters and black voters and talk about, you know, kind of I, spread. Be- and he's not trying to sell Trump. Trump knows that those that he, they're not winning. Trump's not winning over new people at this point. Right. He's trying to talk about. Uh, whatever things that they don't like about Biden, remind them about it, exaggerate how bad it is, you know, use misinformation and and so scare them. Um, and, and then also with the the kind of Haley voters, like maybe convince them just not to vote. Right. Like I like try to yeah. try to scare them. Uh, that's that's where the migrant caravan stuff c- kicks in. Right. So I, I, I'm, I'm worried about that. And I think that that if you look at what the battleground is going to be, it's going to be mostly speaking to the same voters, but Biden trying to convince them that Trump is scary and that he's actually cares about them and Trump trying to convince them that they need to be freaked out about whatever, transing of children and immigrants. (laughs) Yeah. Well, we'll obviously leave it there. Uh, a lot more to talk about as this continues to move forward, but we'll we'll keep an eye on polling in both Florida and North Carolina, as well as the other swing states as we move forward. Again, for those watching right now, if you want to support the work that Tim is doing, subscribe to The Bulwark. I'll put the link right here on the screen and also in the post description of this video. I'm Brian Teller-Cohen. I'm Tim Miller. This is Inside the Right. Mm-hmm.